Welcome to the pre-recorded lecture series for social marketing. Before we kick off the content, I just want to explain that the idea behind doing the pre-recordings is so that you have a chance to look at the content for the week before coming to the lecture. You can then use the time at the lecture for discussions, interaction, I can highlight key points and summary elements, and we can have the in-depth detailed slides available for you to go back to and to go through at your pace. While you are watching the pre-record series, what you do have available to you is the opportunity to ask me questions straight away. This is why I'm asking people to have Twitter accounts, is so if there's something on the pre-records that didn't make sense, you didn't necessarily understand what I was saying, send me a message across Twitter at MKTG3024 or make a comment with the hashtag for the course code. If you send it to me directly as the app message, it'll pop up on my phone and if I'm around the place, I'll give you a response. So you can ask questions live whilst you're watching a pre-record. If you're using the hashtag, that'll get uh, drawn together later in the week and responses will be a little bit delayed, but if you want a quick response and you have a quick question, Twitter's the way to go. So what we're dealing with in the first chapter. This is going to be a fairly intensive level of information dump. It's about 30 slides worth of content telling you about the definition and domain of social marketing. This is laying out the groundwork for what we're going to cover during the semester, what everything looks like, and also set you up for several of the assessment tasks. Now, one of the things that is always required in social marketing is that you have to pick a definition. You don't get to write your own definition. You have to work with one of the ones that pre-exists. However, the idea is that across the course of the semester, in the assessment tasks that you'll be doing, you'll be facing a couple of challenges that will be heavily influenced by how you define social marketing. So there is an asset on the course site which is basically a large collection of definitions that I put together a couple of years ago. There is usually the URL or the reference for tracking down the original article. So what I want you to do, pick a definition of social marketing, adopt it as your own and use it. As you go through Certainly in the exam questions and definitely in the assignments, you will be asked to use your definition and you will occasionally be asked questions about how does your definition influence how you perceive this particular aspect of marketing. So it will be important to select, adopt and learn your definition as you roll through the semester. Now, as a starting point, we just have the generally agreed on commercial marketing. I use both definitions, that is the American Marketing Association 2007 definition and the Chartered Institute of Marketing 2005 definition. If I've taught you any other marketing subject before, I have probably shown you these definitions, but the key for you here is that you can use either or both. Now fundamentally social marketing is about using marketing theory and applying marketing theory to social causes and social change campaigns. So what you need to do is to pick a definition of social marketing, but also when we are talking about marketing itself, have it clear in your own mind. What is it that marketing means and what fundamental elements are part of that meaning of marketing that you have to be thinking about when you're trying to adapt it for use in social causes. So we've got the Americans, who are the verbs, the activity, institutions, processes. They have that neat little catchphrase, create, communicate, deliver, exchange. They have the offerings that have value. And they have the target audiences of customers, clients, partners, and society. 
on the other side of the pond we have the Charles Institute of Marketing from the UK who have marketing as the management process the little trifecta of identify, anticipate, satisfy and the target being the customer requirements profitably. Now quite often profitably ends up being a bit of a barrier for people to use. In your case there is an actual explanation of how you can use profitability and profitably within a social context and within the context of social causes. So the first thing that we really need to do in terms of groundwork is the question of what is social marketing, what is social marketing the subject area, what is social marketing in terms of meanings and definitions. The very first thing you need to come to grips with is that there is no singular, uniform, widely agreed upon definition of social marketing. There are contenders, there are variations, and I have about 40 different definitions at my disposal. This, to me, is a feature. For you, it is also a chance to pick one that best suits you. And this is why I think it's the feature, is that we've got all these different ways of defining a fundamental principle, which is the use of marketing for social change. So select the definition that best suits you. I have a formal definition of social marketing. I have my own one that we will be covering in the slides, but you are not required to use it or adopt it. Pick the one you think best represents how you want to approach changing the world. So the first of the definitions is the one that sits inside the textbook that uh, was the email exchange, Nancy Lee, the author, one of the authors of the text, Michael Rothschild, who's a significantly influential figure in social marketing theory, Bill Smith, who's the editor of Social Marketing Quarterly. And they look at social marketing as a procedural element. They use the marketing principles approach that is very familiar if you've seen the AMA definition here. But they have the idea, and this is some of Andrew, Alan Andreessen's work in here as well, of the idea of influencing a target audience behavior to benefit society and the individual. So the key there is the influence of behaviors for good. So going back historically now, the definition of social marketing, where it all began, the Kotler and Zoltman article back in 1971, which I think probably predates everybody. Social marketing is at this point being defined for the very first time. So you also need to understand the context here is that marketing has being used for non-commercial purposes. It's a big period of thinking and social revolution in the marketing sense that marketing had gone from a definition of moving goods and services from producer to market and was starting to become but has not yet actually transitioned into a definition that talks about the marketing mix. As a matter of uh, side issue, the marketing mix itself is only about 10 years old at this point. So, Kotler and Zoltman, the original definition, looks at this in terms of design, implementation and control. So it's a conscious, deliberate effort. It is a calculated behavior. It uses programs, so this is ongoing rather than one-off. And it's interesting here that you're looking at idea-based outcomes, influencing the acceptability of social ideas, and it's using that modern new thing, the marketing mix, in the product, the pricing, communication, and distribution, and using marketing managerial thinking in terms of the planning, the marketing research, the design, and the implementation. So we've got a series of ideas and ideologies sitting inside this particular approach. 
Next up, one of the other major influential definitions that took place. Now, there are definitions between 71 and 95, but the 95 Andreasen definition has a significant amount of influence. And this has also been one of the definitions that was quite strongly influencing my teaching of social marketing over the years, and will come through in this subject, despite the fact I have my own definition now. So the Andreasen framework is very similar in terms of the application of commercial marketing technology, whereas we had in Kotler talking about the elements of marketing, Andreasen specifies that actually this is about commercial marketing. Analysis, planning and execution. So again, that process of thinking, mapping out and doing. But he also adds in the concept of the evaluation. So analysis, planning, execution and evaluation, all the steps in the cycle. Again with the programs, so we're looking at ongoing longer term operations rather than one-off products or one-off um, events. Here is one of the big shifts. Is originally it was about influencing the acceptability of an idea. Now it's about influencing the voluntary behavior of a target audience. There are a few other people who have quite a uh, lot to say about the difference between ideas and behaviors. But Andreasen hits it pretty much out of the park here on the influence the voluntary behavior of a target audience for the goal of that person's welfare and the benefit of society. Now the thing with these definitions, as we've been talking through them broken up into component parts, is you need to be able to break down a definition, tear it apart and see what are the key parts, what parameters does it create, what are the outer limits of what your definition allows, and what are the bits that when you look at and say, yes, that is social marketing because it's within my definition, or no, that is not social marketing, it is outside my definition. So if you look here at the elements of the Andreas in 1995, and this is going to be one of your first exercises for yourself, is breaking down the definitions and saying, well, what are the components? What does this definition do in terms of the parameters? So the first item on here is that it is the adaptation of commercial technology. Consequently, anything that a commercial marketer does, a social marketer can adapt. It may not necessarily work directly first go, but it can be adapted, applied, refit, and refigured. So everything you've been learning in your commercial marketing courses can be used here. So you're not limited to just going out and finding where someone's put the word social marketing into a document. If you want to use a market segmentation technique, you can find a commercial marketer and a commercial marketing idea and see whether you can adapt it and make use of it. The application to programs, and then you have to ask yourself, well, what, what are we looking at here with programs? Programs break down to being the clustering of individual campaigns or products or uh, it's an ongoing approach. We have the behavioral focus, so thinking here from a consumer behavior perspective, how do we get people to behave? How do we under get them to engage in activities? Are we looking at buying behaviors? Are we looking at stopping, starting, reinforcing? What's the behavior? But a critical and interesting element here is the idea that it's influence. There's no actual requirement for change. You just have to be putting some degree of pressure and modification. There's also the requirement that it be able to be rejected so that the behavior has to be voluntary. And there's one other element in here is that this is a benefit to society and benefit to the personal welfare of the individual, but it doesn't necessarily benefit the marketer directly. So we can't necessarily do this for direct profit, which takes out a lot of the corporate social responsibility, green marketing, political marketing, a lot of campaigns where there is a very clear I will gain as an individual as a result of people undertaking my social cause.
So that element is absent in the Andreas 95. So moving on from the 95, the other big definition that needs to be highlighted and people need to look at is the French Blair Stevens 2005 because this was the definition that the National Social Marketing Centre in the UK adopted as their core view of what made British social marketing legitimate social marketing. So funding decisions, policy decisions and a lot, a lot of influential thought and behaviour went into promoting this approach of social marketing as a systemic application. So we've gone from application and adaptation, design and implementation to systematic application. Use of marketing concepts and techniques, so it's the ideas, the theory and the practices to achieve specific behavioral goals. So it's a planned, this is the goal, this is the behavior, do we achieve it? And those behaviors have to be linked to a social good. This is very much a government intervention style, steps will be taken, measurements will be used. So this is where the French Blair uh, Stevens definition comes from. It is a policy guiding definition. Again, here the breakdowns are systematic, goal dependent, and the behavior must be related to a social good. Now, coming on to a couple of other definitions that I briefly want to bring to your attention. The idea of the Bill Smith's 2006 definition of social marketing where the key elements here are something I want you to do. I want you to take this opportunity to break down this definition the way we have with the Andreasen, the way we have with the uh, French Blair Stevens, with the Kotler and Zoltman, to break it apart. What are the key components? What are the elements? So that when you come to adopting a definition, you can go and say, well, these are the subparts, these are the components, this is what's important. This is how things work. So that's one of your little tasks and activities, one of the things to do. Do it with the Smith 2006, then do this for your own definition that you're going to be adopting and using. Now, the last definition I'm going to point you to is the Dan 2010. This is the custom definition I put together. Uh, the article will be linked up, it's in the readings. But basically, this definition, there are also two additional slides in the slide deck here that we're not going to go through which have expansions and sub-definitions. It was one of the things that always bugged me about previous definitions is they would say things like to achieve a social goal and never actually say well what is a social goal? So here we're talking adaptation and adoption. We're talking about modification and use. Commercial marketing activities, so you can see some of my pedigree coming back in here. But it's not just the activities, it's the institutions and the processes. It's the idea that any part of marketing, commercial marketing, can be brought across from the structure of a marketing department through to the checklists we use for marketing planning. And for here, for me, it's about making a difference. It's a means to induce behavioral change. People have to be acting differently after the campaign for the campaign to have succeeded. It is about targeted audiences, so there's market segmentation. However, one of the things for me is that you don't actually need permanent resolution. It can be a temporary or permanent basis that someone changes their activity. Maybe it's getting people just to slow down to 40 for the summer months or drive, drive a little more conservatively in the rain but they can drive a little more um, high risk in the dry conditions. Whatever it is, it doesn't need to be permanent. So temporary social campaigns, temporary change is an option. Now, 
just a reminder that the definitions are going to be important. And in the first couple of weeks of semester, one of the things I will start doing is I will start asking you, so which definition do you use? If by week three you are still going, oh, I haven't really picked one yet, you're putting yourself way behind schedule and you're making your life harder than it needs to be. So your task for week one is read through the definition set, find one you like, find one you think you can work with, pick it up, do a breakdown analysis of it, see what the component parts are, and start learning it. Start getting to know this definition, because you'll be using it as we go through, as we are addressing both discussions in class and in your assessment tasks. So, part two. The domain and purpose of social marketing. So the first thing we really need to talk about is that social marketing operates on three levels. We have the social marketer to consumer, which is the downstream approach. We have the social marketer to societal influences, which is the midstream. And we have the upstream, social marketing to law, to educators, to public policy. Now each of these three has a different outcome that it is aiming for. In downstream we're saying that the problem can be solved through direct action by the individual currently in receipt of the problem. In midstream we're saying that there needs to be some change to society but that change can be affected by peer pressure or peer influence or role models and leaders. And in upstream we're saying the change is an environmental issue, that this is bigger than an individual can handle, so that we need a broader intervention. It is possible to do all three at once, that you can have a downstream campaign which is about increasing, the aim is to increase health and well-being in the community, the downstream is encouraging people to cycle to work or walk 20 minutes a day, the midstream is getting the influential others, getting the celebrities, getting the social leaders, getting community leaders to endorse walking or cycling. And the upstream is getting the local council to put in lit bike paths. So to create the environment where the walking and the cycling is actually something that can be done. Downstream, end user, midstream, influencer, upstream, changing the environment. Now, in terms of domain as well, what we do as social marketers is we have a focus on behaviours. We can work with ideas, we can work with influencing the way people think, but we are really dominated by getting people to do. It's not just enough to feel positively, you have to act positively as well. There's a very strong influence on planning. You'll see that throughout the course of this semester and this book you will see a very strong influence of segmentation theory. In fact, segmentation theory is one of the critical aspects in social marketing. How do we address a small group in society to get them to a point that they can solve their problem? Or that we can realize that the problem that they have, whilst they are willing to solve it, requires other interventions. And finally, our modus operandi is we're out to do good. Now, the parameter good is a little open-ended, but we are here, ostensibly, to deliver a positive benefit for society. So let's break those elements down and have a talk about each of the parts. In terms of the focus on behaviour, for those of you who have done consumer behaviour, this is where your skill set comes in. In all marketing, when we're focused on behaviours, we've got a very broad set of options. We are either talking about a behaviour that you currently do, or a behaviour that you do not currently do. So we start with either it's an old behaviour or a new behaviour. We want you to start, continue, or stop a behaviour. So this breaks it down into the sort of challenges we're looking at here. So when it's accept a new behavior, you're in the CB theory, you're in innovation adoption. 
when it's reject a behavior also in innovation adoption but what you're looking at here is do not take up a dangerous behavior modification is we're not satisfied with the behavior that you're undertaking but we can accept it as long as you reduce the intake or lower the amount of times you do this ultimately a lot of campaigns are about abandoning old behaviors that we want you to stop behaving in a certain manner um, and we're looking to either get you to switch to a new behavior or to adopt an absence and this is where there's a very meta conceptual argument here about the idea that doing nothing is in fact a behavior not doing something is in fact a behavior so there is a certain level of discussion that we can get into in the class on that finally we've got the continuation of a desired behavior and switch between behaviors there are less campaigns on reinforcing to continue desired behaviors and more campaigns on either accepting a new behavior or rejecting an undesirable behavior this could be a weakness this is something that you can look at over time but at the moment we're dominant area is we or the community or a politician identifies a social problem and a social solution is set out and we try and get people to implement that social solution and the social solution is usually stop whatever it is you're currently doing or start doing something differently there's very limited amount of work done in hey everybody's doing the right thing keep it up but there are campaigns that do that and this is an option for you to consider the problem we've got with the behavior is in classic marketing in commercial marketing we quite simply can reward good behaviors instantly social marketing not so much in commercial marketing when you buy a beer and you drink a beer you have the immediate effect of the beer well, 20 minutes depending on the strength of the beer but ultimately you get the flavor you get the interaction you get the social environment you get the whole consumption process you get the whole effect immediately same way if we think about this from the point of view of if we are trying to contest against tobacco smoking drinking unhealthy food high salt food the behavior that we're competing against has instant gratification and the behavior that we're offering is an indirect benefit and a non-immediate return and uncertainty so you can go a lifetime of not smoking and still have lung problems you can go a lifetime of not drinking and still have liver problems and you can go a lifetime of healthy activity eating well and jogging every day and yet still have health problems the problem for social marketing is that we are offering uncertain benefits in direct competition with very certain benefits so that's one of the catches that's one of the things we do differently and what makes it harder for us in terms of the systematic planning if you've done marketing strategy have done intro to marketing all of these would be familiar territories we are a, we are marketers that's fundamentally what we do we use marketing principles we do marketing things so we need to have the planning process we need to be thinking what is it as marketers that we would do for a commercial product or any other marketing campaign and bring that when we want to change society or when we want to influence people or get a behavior adopted or get people to stop doing something we will bring all of our planning tools and techniques so there will be a talk about strategy during this semester if you haven't done marketing strategy there will be some readings if you have done marketing strategy yes I will expect you to have remembered last semesters or previous semesters courses and I'll expect you to use some of that knowledge you have social marketing is the adaptation of existing commercial marketing so I'm going to ask you to draw on what you know and to use it and if you learned it in a previous subject you can apply it here segmentation this was a big thing and this is a really 
huge issue and this is something that will cause you some heartbreak when you are a social marketer. The target market issue, because you are trying to make the world a better place, you're trying to save people from themselves, maybe you have a limited supply, do you alleviate symptoms of many or do you cure few? Do you focus your efforts on improving the conditions of a few people? Or do you try and spread your resources across a wider group? Do you go for the people who most need you, the most resistant, the most reluctant? Or do you go for the people most responsive? Do you go for the easy win, the early success, the momentum and the motivation, the societal shifts and the change in attitudes that you would do for a commercial product? Or do you go to the most resistant? Do you go to the laggards and the rejectors and stay at them because they need this message? All those things are up for debate. And this will be one of the discussions we'll have in the class is how, at this point, at the start, as a commercial marketer, or as a marketing student, you feel about segmentation and social causes. The other discussion that we're going to need to have is the concept of defining the parameter of good. Social marketing talks about doing good and societal benefit, but fundamentally anyone can say that they're in it to be good people, and very few people get up in the morning and go, I plan on being evil. Not many of us get that opportunity to stroke our beards, pet our white Persian cats and sit in our underground lairs cackling and saying, today is a day to do evil. <laughs> most of the time, most people, even when objectively you could look back and say that was a, a lot of bad took place here, at the time a lot of people would be able to say through either utilitarian ethics or other reasons, that what they were doing was the right thing and they believed that they were doing the right thing. So this is going to be one of the areas we're going to talk about and the ethics of th social marketing will recur across the semester. Now, the third part of the process here is the difference between commercial marketing and social marketing. And Basically, in a nutshell, these are some of the big points. For social marketing, one of the big things we're after is we're trying to do good and we're trying to have society benefit overall. Which, for the most part, most people sort of, when we start off, say, yeah, look, societal benefit, yeah, that's, that's not really a hard call, says a lot of people at the start. But by the time you're at the end of the semester, it's going to be really easy to say, yeah, financial marketing, financial gain, profit, that's that's a lot easier to, to identify. The second issue, obviously, is the market selection, where you want the biggest profit versus the greatest need, the most responsive market versus the market that's most valuable to you politically. And the third one, and this is the big one that comes up repeatedly, is competition. Most of the time in commercial marketing, you're up against people who offer something similar to you, or at least something comparable to what you're doing. In, in social marketing, though, you're up against the target market's current behavior. A lot of the time in social marketing, you are asking people to stop doing what they're currently doing and do what you want them to do. And that is a difficult ask. You're not even okay. Some of the times you're not even asking for switching behavior. You're asking for cessation. You're asking for, hey, instead of having this thing that occupied a space in your life, could you have a hole there instead? Would you prefer a void instead of um, an actual activity? It's a difficult ask. The other aspect we're going to go through this in a bit of depth in the class and have a bit of a chat about. So this is one of the things I want you to. Yeah, to have an opportunity to think about is in social marketing we have what we I call the oh hell moment because you're sitting there looking at what you do for a living going oh hell so if our competitor is 
sitting on the couch playing video games and knocking back a take out a home delivered pizza that's the product we want people to change we want them to go out and go jogging in Canberra in winter so we're asking people to be cold, wet, miserable, go for a run in the dark, be uncomfortable, get sweaty, get warm in a tracksuit, then realise that as soon as you take that tracksuit off, you're freezing cold again. Swap you out from playing your video game or watching your movie to get you to spend more time because that 30-minute run around the block does not include the post... That's the 30 minutes of running. That doesn't include the getting changed to get ready and get started or the post-training um, shower. To resist peer pressure, namely your friends who are still on the couch, going, yeah, um, why are you going out? Usually also then, once we start your jogging, there's also normally bad news to go with it, or at least we get you to hear bad news about how the sedentary lifestyle is going to kill you. Possibly even risk relationships. Uh, you're never around to play games with your friends, so some of your friends are going to look for a fourth, an alternate fourth partner for the console wars. Give up your leisure time. That sitting around watching TV now becomes a jogging through the rain-soaked and frozen parks of Canberra. Give up looking good because nobody looks attractive when they're jogging in appropriate wet weather clothing that um, is well reflective and warm enough to keep you jogging during you know, Canberra winter. And thankfully, this is only about sort of running. It's not like we've asked you to go to a gym and engage in uh, complicated activities involving heavy metal objects. Yet. So this is frequently the oh hell moment when we look at you and say, yeah, we expect you to do the following things. And commercial marketers are smiling, going, yeah, well, we, our aim is to increase comfort, increase pleasure, decrease time, use peer pressure, give you positive news... Reinforce relationships by making you look prettier, feel better, increase your leisure time, make you look good, and do it e as easily and simply as we can. However, despite all those obstacles, social marketing still succeeds, and this is why it works. We take a consumer orientation, we take a customer orientation, we say, why are you engaged in the behavior you're currently engaged in? What can we ask you to do differently? We use exchange theory, and we're going to spend a couple of slide decks on exchange theory because it's really important to understand what it is we're asking people to trade. What's the value for value swap? And a big secret to social marketing compared to other social change approaches is market research. Understanding who it is that we're addressing, knowing who they are with the customer orientation and what they're about with market research technique is what makes the difference for us. Following up on that is also the aspect of audience segmentation. And this is why this is really critical and why you're going to get absolutely drilled on segmentation across the course of the semester is you need to be able to describe who you are addressing with your social change campaign in depth and detail. We succeed because we know the customer, but if we can't describe the customer, we don't know them. So there's a lot of stuff in research, segmentation, and customer orientation that's critical. The final two elements is we use continuous improvement. The measurement and improvement approaches, the follow-up, the evaluate, and the upgrade, where marketers, after all, every plan has an implementation and evaluation element. And the last part of this is the marketing mix. And that's going to be the second half of the semester, is talking about applying the marketing mix to social causes, social products, to the point in time where you can look at a social issue and go, well, what's the distribution channel that would be needed to solve this problem? How would social price influence this? What's the cost involved, both in time, effort, and money, and in terms of what we're expecting someone to outlay to engage in the behavior we desire versus the reward they're going to get back? All of these things as marketers we think about commercially, we can do in the social change. And finally, the other aspect that's in the world is that social marketing is 
one way of changing society, but it's not necessarily the only way. So there are other elements, and these quite often come up in the upstream or in the midstream, but here on the screen is a set of upstream interventions. That the solution to chronic, uh, a certain set of chronic illnesses that are caused by environmental factors, which was led in the 1980s and 1990s, was the development of unleaded paint and unleaded fuel. Science and technology fixed that far faster than anything we could do in marketing. In terms of incentivizing people to put solar panels, mandatory solar panel Monday made it a lot easier to get panels in place. Decreasing the amount that you would pay for electricity encouraged uptake. Increasing taxation on alternatives to the on the competitor products. These are motivations. All of these elements are in play as social interventions, but they're not marketing. We can work alongside them, but for the course of this semester, if your approach and your answer to solving a problem is to pass a law and put a tax on it, you're not acting like a marketer. So, here's one of the in-class discussions that we're going to be having, and that is probably having this discussion across the course of the semester of when is it social marketing? What is it that makes something social marketing? Now, for you to be able to address this sort of thing, you're going to want to have the marketing definition. You're going to be able to look at your definition and say, does it fit? Is it, are these, you know, if your definition requires that you must induce a behavior and your campaign that you're looking at is only about influencing the acceptability of an idea, is it social marketing? And it's not just a rhetorical or academic question. It is a question of, are we actually doing what it is we set out to do. We set out to be social marketers. Are we engaged in that? So we've got this as a discussion question. The other thing that you will have for every deck of slides is that there's going to be a reading. So this is the Spotswood paper. And this raises two things. The first thing is you have to read the paper. This, You have textbook chapters and the occasional PDF file that you read in preparation for the class. That is basically one of those things you have to do for this subject. What I'm looking at is for this first couple of rounds is I want people to be able to outline what are the key arguments from the paper. This is getting you some practice in analyzing academic articles and written work. So when I say go use theory you know how to. You've got some refresher um, activity in terms of how do I read an article, how do I take out the keys, key points and the highlights, how do I use this? The question, the discussion question based on this paper is can social marketing ever include involuntary behavior change? And if social marketing can do it is there any reason why our commercial marketing kin can't apply similar principles? So that'll be a discussion question and this will roll over the first couple of weeks of semester coming backwards and forwards going through this. If you like you can also tweet a response to this um, give us your feelings, give us your arguments and just at MKTG3024 or with the hashtag MKTG3024 so that's chapter one of the pre-records. There will be one of these for each of the slide decks that exists and we will also talk about reduced versions of these slide sets inside the class so there will be more emphasis on you being able to interact and get involved in the three-hour seminars and more of me doing my monologues electronically on these slide decks. And that wraps up chapter one.